It was Friday, February 23, 1996, and Justice James Burchett entered Room 20D of the Federal Court of Australia to deliver his judgment, an emphatic victory for the ARL. The party at Phillips Street raged long into the night, and for Ken Arthurson and company, the pressure of the most stressful year in their lives was finally released. Within a day, however, a defiant news limited had made one thing very clear. This battle was far from over. This is part two of 100 nil the 26th chapter in the Rugby League Digest's in-depth investigation of the Super League War. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams, here with Andrew Paskin. How's it going, Andy? I'm very well. How are you? I'm just happy that you've fronted up for part two of this chapter. I had serious concerns that you were just going to bury yourself in a hole after your Russell Crowe revelation uh, to close out part one. <laughs> Why would it be embarrassed? I was doing him a favour, providing some <laughs> high quality recording material. Uh, so besides the Russell Crowe story, we ended part one of this chapter on the verge of the Burchett judgment. So we had. Super League players gathered in Suva to await the word. Back in Sydney, it was Court 20D of the Australian Federal Court, a packed courthouse, everyone awaiting the word. Burchett was scheduled to arrive at 3.30. It was closer to 4.45 by the time he came in to hand down the judgment. That, in simple terms, can be summed up with this. In the matter of News Limited and the Australian Rugby League, I find that the attacks based on the Trade Practices Act have all of them failed. I find that the claims of economic duress fail. I find that the claims for breaches of contract have been proved. So that's where we start this chapter with the ARL scoring a decisive victory in the first court case. Yeah, I still remember my uh, schoolmates gloating at me. And at least publicly, this is probably the single most dramatic moment in, or possibly the appeal, but I think this initial judgment is probably more publicly resonant just because of those scenes outside the court, like the volatility of the previous year seemingly coming to an end at this point. What's amazing though is like everyone just thought it was buried. That's it. Five years, it's buried. Yep. There'll be no more Super League and then the next thing you know. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I know I certainly thought the same in February where they signed the loyalty agreements. So maybe by this point, the public should have realized that it wasn't over by a long stretch. Do you think Rebo was sleeping very well after that judgment? <laughs> so I think it would have been a tough night for all involved on the Super League side. On the ARL, it would have been a big sense of relief. Uh, and, you know, Arthurson talked about the fact that, you know, he was getting up at 4 a.m. most mornings. On the day of the judgment, it, he said it kind of felt like he was playing football again, you know, sitting around waiting for the moment. Amazing. Think about like, the stakes of this. I mean... Like, we're always laughing about it, but we're talking about high stakes <laughs> results here. Yeah, exactly. High stakes results that were basically all down to one ban, and that was Justice Burchett. So what we're going to do to start this episode is look at the judgment and look at how it all broke down, basically. I want to start with the headline grabbers, because these are the points of the judgment that were really widely reported beyond the nitty gritty. Uh, and that was basically Super League completely vilified uh, and the individual characters involved viewed as, you know, variously untrustworthy, you know, treacherous, all the rest of it. Like, it, it really was quite damning in terms of the language used and how Burchett felt about what News Limited had done. So this kind of sums it up at base level. The secrecy, deceit and suddenness that were intended to be the hallmarks of this assault upon the League are apparent at every turn in the evidence. The evidence makes it plain that News Limited and the Super League companies acted in the relevant sense with dishonesty. I've got to say, like, I don't want to cast aspersions on the man, but it has the feeling of like a partisan thing. Like, you know, when you watch Fox News versus CNN, like, I don't know. It really did. Like, I was really surprised about some of the language and and how specifically damning it was. And it, it seemed to cross beyond just like legal definitions and, you know, judgments on an action as it related to the law into a question of morality. Yeah. And I don't know how typical or usual that is in terms of the law, but it really did stand out to me, some of the language used. 
But so I want to break down how he spoke about particular individuals, because I think this really stands out. And probably understandably, this is what really grabbed the attention. So we've talked about his thoughts on Bullfrog already, but I think it's worth reiterating. (laughs) Uh, He said that he was a particularly unimpressive witness whose evidence I would not accept on any contested issue unless it happened to accord with my own view of the probabilities. Uh, and went on to say that he was completely corrupted in his actions. Well, that's just a guy who doesn't understand the bullfrogging way. <laughs> Ken Cowley was castigated primarily for not giving evidence. Uh, and we're going to talk about you know the ramifications of that a bit later. But the thing is, though, like you're not supposed to have any negative impact for not giving evidence, right? This is what I, I don't understand. By the law. Yeah. I mean... It's only natural that, that that's what you would think. Why wouldn't you speak for yourself if you've got nothing to hide? But by the law, you're not supposed to be penalised for that. And in one statement when he was talking about a difference in what um, Ken Arthurson said happened to earlier statements that Cowley had made, he said, as I have mentioned, neither Mr Cowley nor Mr Smith, uh, that meaning our old friend David Smith, gave evidence. And so there are a couple of points where he seemed to, while not outright disparaging Cowley, kind of making the argument that he had to go off what, you know, Arthurson said because Cowley didn't give evidence. And again, I'm not a justice of the court, but it seems that the law shouldn't work that way. It <laughs> did get overturned at every point. And that's a- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Rebo was found to be not a reliable witness either. Again, similar to Bullfrog, it was said of Rebo, I accept his version of events only where it accords with my view of the probabilities and went on to say that he was apt to colour his evidence to suit the contentions he was supporting. Barry Maranta and the rest of the Broncos' uh, bosses were, in Burchett's words, I'm satisfied that the representatives of the Broncos, in fact, knew very well what was going on and were intimately involved in it in a way that could probably be called clandestine. Mr. Maranta was engaged in a deliberate exercise in deception. He said Peter Gow, the Cronulla boss, was one of the witnesses who appeared to me in cross-examination to be unreliable. (laughs) At which point Peter Gow went up and cut the wig up uh, (laughs) into 17 pieces. Uh, Conversely, of Arthurson and Quayle, he said, I should make it clear that generally I accept the evidence of each of them. They were extremely able men, and I accept that each was endeavouring to give truthful evidence. Obviously, in a matter of involving a great deal of detail and involving events that occurred over a period of years, my acceptance of them as truthful and capable witnesses does not mean I think their memories were never at fault on any matter, but it does mean that I accept them on essentials and I accept the evidence to which I have just referred. I haven't studied as as hardcore as you, but I fail to see how any of this is relevant. It's like they're saying, we're trying to start a new comp and these agreements are anti-competitive. What's what's it got to do with like... Rebo wasn't that reliable. Like, who cares? (laughs) You're right. And the thing about it is, none of this was the reason that the decision went one way or the other. So the judgment is, you know, a 350 point decision that goes into, you know, various cases in, you know, various courts around the world used as precedences and very detailed legal arguments as to why these either were or were not accepted. So I read all the newspaper headlines first. And so I knew a basic account of what happened because of this. So when I went in to read the judgment, I was expecting this, you know, like full of fury and wrath and this like damning, you know, assessment of Super League and all the rest of it. But for the most part, it was this very dry, dispassionate, you know, legal argument. Um, But it just had these like few sentences sprinkled through it that were like perfect ammunition for Super League to make the case that, you know, it was stacked against them or Burchett was, you know, arguing on emotion and and all the rest of that. Well, it's common to say um, in a judgment that I found this witness reliable or unreliable, but to say like the extra stuff and sink the slipper, it's not that common. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like to say Bullfrog was completely corrupted. (laughs) I mean, that's implied anyway. (laughs) Hey, I was only corrupt when it was necessary. (laughs) But let's get away from the headlines and the attention grabbers and look into the nitty gritty of what Burchett found. And again, this is very much a top level. I'm picking out little points along the way I found interesting. I don't feel equipped to give a proper summation of the case. So effectively, what is most interesting for us is to what resulted with the arrow winning this case. Uh, But I do think it's worth spending some time 
looking at some of the things that Burchett said uh, and how that related to the league. Uh, and one really interesting aspect of this judgment is the way it kind of set up the history of the league and how that was relevant to the case. So Burchett's judgment actually opened like this. On 8th of August 1907, a meeting of about 50 persons was held at Bateman's Hotel George Street, Sydney, which resolved to constitute the New South Wales Rugby Football League. So you can see right there off the bat, you know that we're going deep into the woods of rugby league history. So I I really appreciated how much consideration was given to all of this. Mm. And this is one thing I wanted to say is like, I don't know if Burchett was a rugby league man. I think a lot of this would have been uh, news to him, like something he was finding out for the first time. And regardless of what you think about the actual decision, if you're like me and don't really know much about how the law operates in practice, it really is impressive to see how much work goes into building a case and then judging that case. Oh, yeah. You know, so at various points, you know, one of the arguments which I'll get to was a case involving bananas in the European Union and how that related to the case. So the Super League lawyers would have had to look at that case, establish the precedent and make an argument based on that. Burchett would then need to go and read that case, read what cases, you know, made up that and establish whether it was relevant based on all this detailed legal research. So you can really understand why these things take so much time like to make a case and then to judge that case. Well, if we think Steve Edman made out for the Super League, I mean, the uh, legal team's really made out. (laughs) (laughs) And so part of this aspect of looking at the league history was to look at how decisions were made and how things to do with competition and the market and all these things we discussed in part one are affected by decisions made in rugby league and how the game was administered. So uh, this is one statement from the judgment that sets that up a bit. Like, for example, those in charge of a church hospital, the board of the league is motivated in large part by considerations other than the pursuit of profit. It is concerned with the preservation and enhancement of the traditions of the game. Just as the hospital has a religious and moral mission, the Good Samaritan delayed his business and expended some of his funds to serve a higher duty. So lack of effective competition from other sports, at least in the long term, is not necessarily the reason the league has hesitated to jettison its weaker clubs before they've had an opportunity to recover. So this went into discussing excluding Newtown from the league, attempts to get rid of Wes and all the rest of it, which Super League was arguing that that was evidence of competition within the clubs, that you know the league had accepted that at various points and made the decision to exclude teams. Uh, This was rejected by Bichette, said that, well, It's clear that Newtown weren't excluded. They excluded themselves by not being viable, going on to note, you know, similar considerations and decisions at various points after that. Well, Newtown is still going now. (laughs) (laughs) And then just little bits of the argument that came into it. So one of the Super League arguments was that by offloading the pay TV rights for next to nothing, the ARL was weakening the competition and wasn't effectively, you know, operating. It's a fair point. And this was argued in relation to a monopoly that, you know, it wasn't a competitive market. And by being so in tow to to Channel 9 and and not looking for the best deal, they were like weakening competition. And this, again, was rejected by Burchett, which basically from here on in, anytime I say Super League argued this, uh, you can assume that what they argued was rejected by Burchett. Like it, it can't be overstated what an overwhelming victory this was for the ARL. Um, But on this specific point, Burchett said, its objective in respective of television is not simply to get the highest price. On the evidence, at the time the arrangements with Channel 9 were made, the league had reason to be very dissatisfied with the way its interests had been served by the previous telecaster, Channel 10. And I mean, he's right in that respect. And yeah, like you want the game on TV, that's the objective. But at the same time, like that's no reason to effectively donate the pay TV rights to Kerry Packer. Yeah, it's insane. But as I mentioned in part one, a big part of the argument was about the the limitations of the market. So where does competition start and end? I mentioned that banana case, and this was actually a case between the United Brands Company versus the Commission of the European Communities. And Super League argued that in that case, bananas were viewed as being their own market separate from, you know, apples and oranges and other fruits. So their argument was, well, if 
bananas are in competition with themselves, not with oranges, well, then surely we are too. And, you know, rugby union and the rest are effectively apples and oranges in this case. Well, I mean, it just comes down to your definition, doesn't it? You're going to have a wide market and say, well, um, rugby league is competing with Mission Impossible 2 as well, or entertainment, or is it it's individual sports? It's just- yeah, exactly. And that's what the ARL argued. They said, well, no, we're in competition with other sports. We're in competition with other entertainment products. If the price of a rugby league game admission is too high... Well, then families will go to the circus instead. Therefore, that is competition. <laughs> That's an odd comparison, but yeah. I don't know if they actually use the circus as an example. Um, <laughs> I've got it in my notes, but I'm not, I can't remember if that is the ARL's words or mine. But <laughs> well, actually, it's not that big a jump from the ARL circus to the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Super League also used US examples, which were found to be, you know, not relevant to the Australian market. I mean, but how can you use US to compare Australian sport? Like The point of all this discussion of the markets was to work out whether the precluding a rival competition counted as monopolization by the ARL and was therefore an exclusionary provision, restraint of trade, whatever the precise legal term is. So the ARL's argument was that it wasn't competition, it was a takeover. So Super League weren't trying to operate alongside ARL, they were trying to take them over and therefore it couldn't be considered competition. Uh, And again, so this was effectively accepted by Burchett that this was how it played out. That's a decent argument though. Yeah. If you're setting up your own stall next door or or if you're uh, you're burning down the other one. (laughs) (laughs) You could maybe make the case that if Super League had challenged the loyalty agreements without launching the April Fool's raid, they may have had a better case in this regard, Mm. you know, and saying, well, no, it's not a takeover because we're just trying to start a competition and being effectively shut out of competing for rugby league in Australia. I just can't see how forcing people to sign a five-year exclusivity agreement is not a restraint of trade. Yeah. And so this is what it all came down to. This is where Burchett ruled in favour of the ARL and this is where it was overturned on appeal. But in terms of his reasoning for accepting the loyalty agreements. He basically said that the agreements were designed to preserve the competition and therefore it was reasonable. He said, I accept that Mr. Arthurson's purposes were of this nature and that this was the guiding mind of the league on the matter. It just seems that, well, yeah, I mean, that's Arthurson's intent, but that doesn't really come into the legality of the agreements, does it? Well, it's like that Microsoft, the big antitrust case in the late 90s it's like that they were trying to preserve their uh, their monopoly on the yeah. operating system market it's like i fail to see how he's come up with this but i mean like i said an ignoramus regarding corporate law yeah but again the issue of duress is the one where i see that the arl were always going to have trouble and there were basically two points to the duress there was the signing of the agreements with the threat of being expelled from the league and then there's the second yeah. issue of packer coming in and throwing his weight around. So these were the two main thrusts that were argued by Super League. Uh, And again, they were both shut down by Bichette. He said, The second matter can be quickly disposed of. I do not think a vigorous assertion by Mr. Packer of legal rights, which there is no reason to doubt Channel 9 genuinely claimed to hold, could have amounted to duress exercised by the league. And, well, the way I see it, the league brought Packer into the meeting (laughs) to stand up in front of them and say, don't sign this or you'll be sued. Like, I don't see how you can separate Packers' actions from the league on this point. Well, it's just an extension of the league, isn't it? Yeah. And then on the first point, one of the the ways he argued against the idea of duress was the fact that some of the rebel clubs who'd signed expressed either at the time or during the court case that they were happy to sign the agreements. So Burchett said, According to Mr. Rebo, Mr. Morgan, the chairman of the Brisbane Broncos, said at the time, we should be cracking champagne. We were in the competition for five years. Mr. Moore, whose evidence in chief on this subject, as on a number of others, I do not accept, conceded in cross-examination, no, to be quite honest with you, sir, I was quite happy to sign the loyalty agreement. I mean, that on on Bullfrog's account, that does seem quite damning when you're arguing for duress. (laughs) you got to understand the bullfrogging away. That's all you got to understand. But <laughs> if I was in the gallery, uh, what do you want Judge, take your manly scarf off. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But on this, I can see where Bichette's coming from when there are these statements saying they were, were happy to sign the agreements. But I can also see the nature of the way those agreements were signed and the threat of expulsion, which Burchett downplayed. But I mean, this was a threat that was regularly made by the ARL about clubs at different points in time. You know, in the early 90s, they talked about expelling Norths because of their stance on tobacco. They announced almost every year that the Broncos might be getting kicked <laughs> out, you know? <laughs> like, But it's like, it's irrelevant what Peter Moore said at the time. It's like, the only relevance is what the ARL did. Like, yeah. What Peter Moore said doesn't mean jack squat. Yeah, exactly. What were the ARL's actions? That's all we got to worry about. Yeah, yeah. And this is from a University of New South Wales Law Journal article, which after reading this, I don't understand how Burchett could have so easily downplayed the idea of duress. So I'm just going to read this. A letter of 7 February 1995 accompanied the draft loyalty agreements, which were sent to the chief executive of each club. It stated, the league will view the failure of any club to sign and return the deed by the deadline, as an act of gross disloyalty. And I also refer you to yesterday's meeting of the league, which passed a resolution to recommend that the board of the league consider the expulsion of any club which fails to sign and return the deed by the deadline. Signed, Stalin. (laughs) I I, I mean, it seems pretty clear on that statement that there was a leaning on them to sign these agreements. Gross disloyalty? (laughs) I mean, we could go on for three hours about all the points in this judgment. As I said, there are about 350 of them, which makes for very interesting reading. But I think we'll just move on because I think this adequately shows you the tenor of the judgment and how it could perhaps be overturned so overwhelmingly on appeal. So let's move on to the aftermath. And in the courtroom itself, it was a kind of surprisingly muted reaction, a, you know, a silence that greeted the announcement as it took some time for the news to sink in. Arthurson talks of having to look to Colin Love to see the smile form on his face before he knew that it was all over at that point. It must have been the biggest party, though. Uh, It certainly was. And um, when I mentioned that fly-on-the-wall moment, this is where I want to be. Phillip Street on the (laughs) night of Friday, the 23rd of February, uh, for so many reasons. But the number one reason would be to... Be there in the flesh to see uh, one of the office girls, as they were known in the parlance of that less enlightened era, one of the office girls serenade Ken Arthurson late in the night with a rendition of Wind Beneath My Wings uh, that apparently left (laughs) not a dry eye in the room. Was that his secretary, Pam Parker, or...? No, it wasn't Pam. So uh, Pam was the last one manning the desks at Phillips Street that day. She would actually was on leave and returned just for the judgment. Um, so I'm sure she partied long and hard into the night, along with everyone else. But it was a, a different unnamed uh, office girl who gave this rendition, which I first read it in the Super League book. And it's one of those things where you just think was some kind of embellishment. You know, it either didn't happen at all or it happened in a very muted, uh, you know, understated kind of way. But I've, you know, Mm. got triangulation of this event with three separate accounts, uh, the Super League book, uh, Phil Gould's book, a newspaper report a few days later by Roy Masters, which all tell the story in pretty much the same way. So it seems like the game's lost a bit of the earnestness that would be like derided now, you know? Yeah, yeah. I can't picture like Todd Greenberg's executive assistant singing to him. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And and I think uh, for better and worse, Arco did inspire this kind of loyalty and this kind of reaction. Uh, And he would have slept so soundly that night. Can you imagine? Oh, it's hard to, because you know it's coming in the future, but I feel happy for him at this moment. I know, know, yeah. Like when you know how much this war took out of him, the amount of relief I feel each time we finish recording one of these episodes, like yeah. it, it is so immense. Like I couldn't imagine a more overwhelming sense of relief to get through every one of these. So I can only imagine like a year of this, a year of 4 a.m. starts, of health scares, of being, you know, assaulted in the press, of, you know, endless press conferences and meetings and everything else. Like, it really is quite incredible the pressure he was under for this year. He wasn't a young man either. No. Not long before the verdict came down, he was sitting in his office talking to Graham Richardson about everything that was going on and, like, half collapsed into a chair 
um, you know, was having trouble breathing and got sent to hospital. I mean, when I read that in your notes, like it actually rocked me. Like uh, the pit in my stomach, I felt sick, you know, like just you forget the human element of it because it's so yeah. so crazy and so funny for us and everything. This is a, like a, you know, a good bloke that's like giving his health to the game. It's yeah, like, yeah. It really upset me. Exactly. And after all this and particularly reading the Arco book, you know, which came out in 97, like it really is amazing that Arco is still, you know, he's 91 now, 92, and, you know, he's been through so much and he's still there on the Gold Coast doing it. So I, I think that uh, says a lot about the resilience of the man. Well, I just wanted to say that because, like, the human cost on Rebo, like, you'd think this didn't affect that bloke's life. Oh, yeah. This debacle. Like, at the end of his series, we've got to send both of them a bottle of Dimple. Yeah. But so in the midst of this, like, overwhelming relief and the feeling that it was all over, you know, because I'm sure at this point on the Friday night, they weren't thinking of appeal. They were thinking of round one, you know, to take place in a couple of weeks. You can kind of forgive them for some of the crowing that went out in the press. So there, there were some, you know, pretty strong statements. Arco said, we didn't win by a football score. We won by a cricket score. Um, <laughs> you know, Maybe he shouldn't have been gloating so quickly. <laughs> no, you know, a few days later, fair dinkum. I've got blokes unloading vegetables, ladies in lovely suits, shop assistants and the odd drunk telling me they are happy with Justice Burchett's decision. <laughs> But at least, Arco, I can forgive him those statements. I think overall he was quite magnanimous. His media man, Jeff Prenter, not so much. This also comes from uh, Mike Coleman's book. Back at the court building, Jeff Prenter, his face even pinker than usual, stands at the top of the stairs <laughs> and, and calls down to reporters, pretending to look at a list of names on his sheaf of court papers. You'll be right, he says to one. Your name's here. You'll get your press pass. He looks at another, then back to, down to his list. Yeah, you're okay. Then he spies a third. Sorry, he calls, shaking his head. Know anything about tennis or soccer? <laughs> I didn't realise Mike Coleman had that in him. Just a bit of a, a slipper sinking on the pink face. I wonder if Coleman got the, you know, look for another profession line from Prenter and that's why he yeah, decided yeah, yeah. to... <laughs> <laughs> but in rugby league, there's always that, you know, bit of niggle after, yeah, after yeah, a yeah. spouse. Yeah, you can I, accept I, that. Yeah, I think like it would have been at least partially in jest. <laughs> but some of the statements speak of maybe a misunderstanding of the law and how it works. Like this was an Arthurson statement in the immediate aftermath. I feel an overwhelming sense of relief. I always felt we could win, always had faith in the justice system. The basic thing that sustained me through all of it was a long-held belief that if you were honest and upfront in the way you conducted yourself in life, then you'd get through. I was sustained by the belief that we were fighting for right. No, I have a deal. Well, yeah, like when I read that, the first thing I thought of was the castle. And I was thinking that this is a very the castle understanding of the legal system. It's not a competition, it's a home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I realised that at this point the castle hadn't come out. So maybe it wasn't in the minds of the, you know, the people involved. But this is a quote from Roy Masters in his book. For many rugby league supporters, the original judgment had helped undermine the long-held notion that our legal system is a rich man's law. The common perception was that while Rupert Murdoch was powerful in political circles, he could not have his way in the courts. The man in the street saw the first judgment coming down on the side of what was obviously right, rather than what was merely legal. And it's like, that's not how the law works. I don't think it's a case of a rich man's, but they're both rich men fighting each other. Yeah, yeah. But so that was the party. Let's get to the meeting. And obviously the reaction on the Super League side was uh, more muted than the ARL. It started with uh, the big reveal of the immediate resignation of David Smith. So uh, he exits our story at this point, And I'm sure by March next year, we'll be referring to him as uh, Mr. White or, or something similar as Morris Lindsay did. I don't know how well we'll remember his name, um, but, but, <laughs> but he leaves us now. Beside that resignation, there wasn't any real recrimination or fallout. Everything turned towards the appeal. So I think it was the next day that Ken Cowley made a statement saying that they thought they had very reasonable grounds for appeal. Our resolve remains undiminished. We will respect the law, but we will not walk away. In the future, this will be viewed as a temporary, if painful, reversal. So I think this should have been clear to the ARL that it wasn't over. And then for all their, you know, much-deserved celebrations, you know, there was going to be 
a second part to this. I found it curious that John Tanaskovic, prior to the case, was suggesting that even if we lose this one, we'll get him on appeal. Like, yeah. he had some sort of inkling. Yeah, it's funny. Tanaskovic basically picked it perfectly. He had prepared News Limited for the idea that they would lose this first judgment but win on appeal. Uh, and that's exactly how it played out. So I, d- I don't know what he knew, whether it was something about Burchett or, yeah. or what it was. Maybe he was a people power style judge or something. Yeah, and it's funny because at the time it was reported that, you know, Atanaskovic may be a, a scalp uh, as a result of, of Super League losing the case. But it was basically him in Murdoch's ear saying, let's appeal, we're going to win this. So if anything, his estimation only rose as a result of them losing the case and then going on to win on appeal. But again, from the, the media in particular, the rugby league media, there was maybe a level of naivety about the law. Like, you know, there was a Herald article a few days later arguing that it was throwing good money after bad due to how decisively the ARL won the first case. And Arthurson again, this was the exact 100 nil quote that I mentioned last week. I was to say many times that it was like playing the same team twice under the same set of rules with the only difference being a new referee and winning 100 nil the first week, then losing 100 nil the next. Like, I think there was a failure to understand that, like, in this game, the score resets at halftime. They were playing under Justice Greg Hartley the next week. <laughs> <laughs> but so before the appeal, we had the orders that were going to come down. And, you know, so there was going to be a delay between the judgment and the orders. In the meantime, News Limited filed for a, a stay of the orders, basically, so they could kick off their competition in spite of the orders that were going to come down. That was refused by the court, which when the date in court was announced, you know, to talk about the stay of the orders, someone in Super League described it as a great victory, to which Colin Love said, great victory? Who was their spokesman? Walter Mitty? Which is another, like, (laughs) I love, like, the rugby league tradition of really outdated cultural references. So (laughs) Walter Mitty, a story originally published in The New Yorker in 1939, a a film of 1947. We've had Warren Ryan's love and frequent mention of Biggles. My favourite one is Keystone Cops. I feel like it, it, <laughs> yeah. it's a reference that like league journalists today will still go, oh, who's running this, Keystone Cops? Yeah, but it's so appropriate, that's why. <laughs> I mean, my favourite's the Phantom from Wally, King Wally, but, um, but Biggles is up there and, and a good try by Colin Lovely. <laughs> so basically the orders that the ARL were asking for were basically a complete stop of Super League. They were even trying to get the start of Super League stopped worldwide so that, you know, this decision in Australia would effectively stop Super League from kicking off in England. You know, that wasn't to go through, but it was very prohibitive orders that they were seeking. Uh, So the judgment was handed down on the 23rd of February. It was to be the 11th of March that the orders were announced. So basically you had two weeks of a lot of speculation. Everything was up in the air. I would have loved if it went to the House of Lords. Yeah. The highest court in the English yeah. land. Hmm, yes, yeah, quiet. These northern ruffians want to play rugby league on here. Hmm. <laughs> Super League were pushing for damages over orders. Basically, they were hoping to, you know, buy their way out of the problem. Can you imagine, like, rugby league fans outraged that teams could try to buy comps if you could, you know, <laughs> buy, <laughs> buy the orders? <laughs> I mean, a ton of scope was just trying to buy the comp. <laughs> but so a lot of the things being suggested at this point were that Super League could just decamp to England, take all the players over there, uh, and either, you know, have them all injected into the English competition or, you know, bring their clubs over there and have some super competition. You know, there was an idea of basically NRL Ireland before its time you know, taking it offshore and, you know, having the teams play, you know, on some Pacific outpost and beaming it back to Australia. Well, if you recall the 2003 Penrith premiers, some of their players that went on the kangaroo tour were complaining there weren't enough TABs in the Czech Republic. (laughs) Um, How would the players go all being moved to England? (laughs) You know, there was an idea they could funnel the best players into the Mariners and the Rams who weren't, you know, subject to ARL agreements. So I guess you could have like a, you know, Harlem Globetrotters, Washington Generals type two-team competition. (laughs) I would have loved it if the Mariners got sticky. (laughs) There was one idea that they could make some new game, you know, Lugby Reeg, 
an 11 a side <laughs> game with like modified <laughs> rules, you know, something like along that lines. Or even to just pack up and start playing Rugby Union. And this is probably the one that, like, in all seriousness, could have gotten off the ground considering, you know, News Limited had the rights to the Super Rugby. If they did that, they would have lost me at Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but at this stage in the press, Super League was still talking about starting their competition in 1996. Like, they were seriously arguing that there was a chance that the orders would come down that would allow them to continue playing. Like, I don't know how that could have happened. All I remember is that there was such a definitive drubbing in the court that like, I thought it was over. Just, yeah. you know, it was just forgotten about in my mind. Yeah, no, same. But, but there was actually a lot of discussion about it. One Sydney Morning Herald article reported that Mark O'Brien, the ARL lawyer, said, O'Brien had no doubts that News Limited had been nailed for dishonesty and they would be unable to go ahead and run their own competition and sandbag the ARL. He said any game Super League put on will be contempt of court. On seven, Wally Lewis was saying that he was not so sure. Perhaps there may be two competitions, with the Brisbane Broncos, for example, fielding a team of juniors in the ARL and being part of a small competition composed of players whose ARL contracts had run out and were contracted to Super League. Nobody can stop them from playing, said the King. I just love that those (laughs) two uh, theories were like just put on the same level without question. (laughs) So Mark O'Brien, you say, is the king of defamation law. Wally Lewis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I reckon they could still play. It's still on. <laughs> it's all sweet. Well, apparently people aren't taking Mark O'Brien's theories on the short ball uh, <laughs> as high as Wally's, but they're taking Wally's <laughs> legal opinion. <laughs> He's like the phantom. He can get, it, he can get it out of anything, Wally. And if you need a tiebreaker, uh, who else do you want but Turvey Mortimer, who came in and said, <laughs> there may be juice left in the squash Super League lemon. So there it is. Two... <laughs> 2-1 to Super League starting in 1996. Is that Turvey from the uh, the idea of taking a team to Parks, Turvey? Uh, I think it was Albury, you'll find. But in the immediate, what this did was put a, a halt to both of the competitions that were about to start. Uh, in Super League's case, that meant a cancelling of a lot of season launches. We do, of course, know that the Hunter Mariners went on with theirs and introduced the world to the Ship Shapes. <laughs> I still want to get a reunion of the Ship Shapes. So, Andy, please use your Newcastle connections. Uh, anyone else, please, we have to make this happen. This series will not stop until we've reunited the Ship Shapes. Well, I used to deliver pizzas when I worked at Domino's as an 18 year old or whatever to a, a Hunter Mariners cheerleader. As I remember from the game, she had curly hair. Really? And. I remember the house. I remember the house in Butterbar. I could just roll up and just go, what's going on? <laughs> so do you think she may have very well graduated from ship shape to... Uh, did the Mariner Cheer Girls had a name that you remember? I think they were the mermaids. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I was thinking the Sharks Girls may have been mermaids. Mermaids brings a bell. I don't know if there's too much into cheerleading squad squabbling over names. <laughs> I think you could probably get away with two. <laughs> One season launch that had been planned, a big spectacle, was by the Penrith Panthers. And I'm just going to read this. Penrith will top the lot. While Penrith is already planning to spend $80,000 on entertainment at each home game, their opening bash, (laughs) a free open house evening at Australia's Wonderland next Thursday, is to be even more extravagant. (laughs) Organisers hope 10,000 people will attend. Fans will enjoy free rides and show bags and see the players model their new football jumpers to the club's new theme song, Wild thing. The new squad of cheer girls, the Wildcats, will have their first outing, as will the new club mascot, Samantha the Panther, hopefully in her new Panther mobile. Great name, Samantha the Panther. I love that. <laughs> How much of the 80K was spent on like a Rodney O style announcer? <laughs> well, it was Rodney O, so. But like what they should have been doing was spending money on the paint for those red seats, those bright, yeah. <laughs> fluorescently red seats that showed up every person that wasn't at the game. <laughs> It's the same as Bruce Stadium in the 90s with those fluoro yellow yeah. seats. Like, what was the idea? Just to embarrass yourself regarding crowds? But to me, that you know, this report about the Panthers season launch and, you know, the extravagant entertainment and free show bags at Wonderland, it speaks of a problem that Super League was always going to have. Like, they've got this, you know, American global vision and this is, you know, a new era. It's going to be, you know, high tech and top shelf entertainment. And it's like, American Splash and Spectacle works in America because they have the means to do it. But I think as a nation, we are at heart like a rinky-dink operation. 
in the most endearing, lovable way. But I think it's more at heart we're a no bullshit operation. Yeah, but regardless, attempts to go big always look disingenuous and always just <laughs> no, highlight how rinky dink it is. No, but we're forgetting at that time. We're talking about ninety five, ninety six. Like this is pre internet, start of the internet. Like no one was into global culture at that no. point. Like it was like people would still say, I'm not eating bloody McDonald's and a real hamburger. You know what? Like- yeah. Do you remember that uh, early Aussie hip hop, Australia don't become America? <laughs> Great sentiment, I think. <laughs> but they were right in the approach they were going to take, but they were ahead of their time, I think. I think it was a misreading of the room. It was embarrassing. Let's just yeah. <laughs> call it what it was. <laughs> like, I mean, but Australia's one land to go on the demon, go backwards up the loop. <laughs> Have a good night out. But just the fact that every club, you know, part of their launch seemed to involve show bags. <laughs> well, the show was a real big entertainment source yeah. in that era. The Mariners were going to launch their season in addition to the ship shapes by, you know, a stall at the Newcastle show handing out show bags. <laughs> really? At the Newcastle show? Yeah, yeah. Oh, mate, if I had known that, I would have been in there like a beaver and a hunk of wood. Like the show in Newcastle, especially in that era, was huge. Yeah. Absolutely huge. And everyone went. And um, it was right near the Newcastle Falcons arena. And, I mean, it's a really good atmosphere there. Everyone's got Pluto pups, all the rest of it. That would have been the most vitriolic stall. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of the Newcastle show would not have been on display at that stall. Do you think Barbara Davis would have led a procession of Aussies for the ARL and, <laughs> you know, put a picket line in front of the stall? <laughs> I reckon Barbara Davis would have been fuming had she known that they had a stall. <laughs> and Foxtel themselves had to launch their season without any Super League content. You know, they had a big opening Fox Sports extravaganza, which Super League was to heavily feature. That suddenly had to be like completely excised from proceedings. Well, I remember that and it didn't really matter because everyone was so amazed that you could have a 24-hour channel for sports. Yeah. And even if it was like, I think they had like rally cars and other weird shit on there. Yeah, it was such a new era for Australian TV that it's like, in one sense, it didn't really matter. Of course, you know, that's called into question when one of the two channels has rugby league and the other doesn't. Obviously a big hole in their uh, promo, but I was still amazed by it at the time. But then on the ARL side, the biggest thing for them was, of course, having to suspend the start of the competition. So it was due to kick off the following weekend from the decision on 3rd of March. And due to the delay from the judgments and all the rest of it, it was pushed back at least three weeks. But finally, the hammer did come down the 11th of March. The orders came in, which were crippling to Super League. So any idea of the competition starting in 1996 uh, were put to bed. It's not the last we'll hear of Super League trying to start the competition in 1996. Uh, You'll notice we haven't really mentioned clubs or players in this chapter. That's because there's so much going on in terms of clubs and players and their reaction to the judgment and the orders that they get their own chapter, which is going to be a big one. So that is our next chapter. Uh, We'll hear about everything that happened uh, with the clubs and players there. But for the moment, Super League in Australia is dead in 1996. The ARL gets, you know, a commitment that Super League can't start in Australia for five years. Anything even resembling Rugby League can't be staged by Super League. The players were ordered back to the clubs. Super League were to pay for a significant amount of the contracts, even though they were going to be playing in the ARL competition. It was just an bloody hell overwhelming victory to the ARL, which... Could maybe be expected given that it was Burchett who was listing the orders, the, the same Burchett who ruled so in the ARL's favour in the judgment. So following this decision, you can understand there were two very different reactions from ARL and News Limited. On the ARL side, there was a real attempt from Arthurson to be magnanimous and to see this as an opportunity to get to a resolution So one moment uh, on a sports show, Chris Anderson launched into Arco and the ARL. And in response, Arthurson said, he said some shocking things. I could have responded. Every bone in my body was aching for me to get stuck into them, but I restrained myself. My belief is that a genuinely conciliatory approach on our side is the best way to try to find a solution to the game's problems. But I'll tell you what, it's not easy. It just goes to show like in the second episode of the series, we spoke about the naivety of Arthurson with these big moguls, but his real skill is diplomacy and, um, you know, relationships and that type of thing. He's really good at that. Yeah. And I think he also knew what was at stake, that, you know, the game had to come back together. 
I mean, all you had to do was look at the bottom line and see that, you know, what was the point of winning if, you know, rugby league was so distressed and out of public favour? So there was, yeah, right. it was definitely in his interest to get the teams together. But also I think he just wanted it to be over. He just wanted to get back to watching Manly play the Broncos and that side of things. I think that was quite genuine. Yeah, yeah. The efforts at reconciliation weren't helped by some club bosses. Uh, this was Nick Politis' response to the decision. All I can say is that those Judases had better get on their bikes and leave town because, brother, they are going down. They've got no future in the ARL. I don't mind when people want to compete with you, but not when they go behind your back. <laughs> yeah, reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Judases. But so I think a big thing of Arthurson was to, okay, it's over now, we've won. Now let's take the best ideas from Super League and put them into practice. Like I think, you know, we expressed in previous chapters an ARL reticence or a, a blowing in the wind in terms of their attitude to rationalisation. But I think they were genuine in knowing that change was needed. It was just at various points expedient for them to talk tough on loyalty and tradition. It's really easy to say like, you know, um, that they're always five years off any change, but try and get anything done in rugby league. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they were genuine in thinking that, okay, the decision's over. Now we can get down to business. We'll take the best ideas of Super League and, you know, we'll try to get the Sydney clubs down and put the best product up going forward. They'd actually commissioned a report the year before called the Carriage Report. This emerged at this point of time as something that was, you know, somewhat of a blueprint for ARL future. And it had all the usual kind of, you know, reduction of Sydney teams. And How easy would it be to do that report? Well, it says here that you have 11 teams in one city. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll cut that down to, say, two. And then, um... Yeah. <laughs> and so it was this, you know, road to rationalisation. So, again, this is where the three-year plan comes into it. But this is where it also gets complicated by these loyalty agreements. So Arthurson said... This will probably be the hundredth time I've said it, but loyalty agreements cut both ways. I can't understand why people would ask that question. I've said it in court. I say it every day of my life. We won't be forcing anyone to amalgamate unless they wish to do so themselves. And with that attitude, with that stance, and knowing where you are legally in terms of these agreements, I get back to we're three years away in perpetuity from yeah. serious change. You know, I think the clubs were, also, were always going to dig in. I think the ARL were always going to find it difficult to put these plans into action. But with the clubs running on the honour system for the salary cap, it was all going to be smooth sailing. <laughs> <laughs> but so this is where that two-tier system came into it again and the idea that we'll split into two tiers with a view that that will eventually sort the Super League out by itself. We'll see who's the 10 best and who belong in the second division. This was immediately met with outrage from the clubs, you know, clubs like the Crushers who were saying that they'd really struggle for commercial opportunities if they were in the second tier, which is valid, but it illustrates that it was going to be difficult for the ARL to achieve what they wanted. Well, loyalty agreements are a, a noose around their own neck, aren't they? As Arthurson said, the loyalty agreements cut both ways. But what I found interesting about the carriage report is how it, it went into the nitty gritty. It wasn't just these big picture. You know, one of the things specifically mentioned was the manly factor, the perception that the manly club via Arthurson and Fulton had too much say, you know, so that it was really addressing the perception about how the game was run along with, you know, the need for less Sydney clubs. It was like an, a, an overarching view of the league. There must have been a rugby league man did that report then. Yeah. <laughs> But so um, Ian Heads and Roy Masters both typically latched onto this report and, and had some really um, interesting articles about what it could mean for league future. And what they said wasn't too different to what was in the report. I think both acknowledged the need for change, the positive aspects of Super League, uh, and some of the issues that were holding the ARL back. So I, I don't want to go too deep into what they said, but just I wanted to pick out a couple of things that I found interesting. From Masters, one of his ideas was to schedule matches four weeks in advance. Players and fans need to plan their weekends. If West is scheduled for a Friday night game in a month's time and then lose three games in a row, bad luck. Bugger Channel 9 and their voracious appetite for ratings. I know we're only like a couple of years into the game scheduled like for the whole year in advance, but I didn't realise it was ever that bad that like even scheduling them four weeks in advance could be seen as a big step forward. How did we ever get any crowds at all? I know. 
Like Channel 9 has been an albatross on the game's neck. Yeah, and continues to be. Apart from Spider Cam, which I applaud, <laughs> I'd like to see him go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A couple of things for me in Head's reporting that I really liked. Uh, this one, one of the issues he saw, league naivety, doing business with questionable entrepreneurs, which I think we might read one <laughs> Jay Moore, Muller <laughs> for this. <laughs> Sitting back while players or others with questionable credentials as role models for the game are trotted out as frontmen. Dumb stuff. A- again, an issue which still plagues us a quarter century later. <laughs> Is Ian Heads too intelligent for the game? I mean, seriously. <laughs> I mean, everything he's ever said has just been reasonable and, you know, it's come to fruition. We should have had him as the the boss of the league. I know. Maybe in tandem with Jack Gibson. I love this statement. This was in relation to State of Origin origin players being underpaid, but he went on to say, The indisputable truth, however, is that the players of the game have been overpaid ever since leagues clubs arrived on the scene. Jack Gibson has called it the most heavily subsidized game in the world. (laughs) This guy is that concise. Like he's he's more concise than Dorothy Parker could ever dream to be. Yeah. <laughs> I love the guy. And he's always right. I know. And as a pioneer of the, you know, visits to NFL teams, like on this point, can you imagine if those visits like worked in reverse? You know, <laughs> we've got some NFL executive <laughs> visiting a club. It's like, you know, yeah, so we get a salary cap. That's paid for by the money we get from the league. After that, we lose... Four to twelve million dollars a year, uh, but that's okay because you know we've got leagues clubs who give us the money they've leached off the community, so we end up breaking even, <laughs> barely. Um, and then he goes back and goes, and then they had a keg in the boardroom, and then they started fighting. <laughs> But yeah, I, I just love that the most heavily subsidized game in the world. I just love that statement. How do we not talk about this every week? I mean, this sport is literally propped up by freaking poker machines. <laughs> but News Limited at this point came into compromise talks as if like they'd won the case. Like they were still refusing to move on any point, like even to the point of insisting that the Mariners and Rams be included in a two-conference, 22-team competition. Why would they agree to any compromise? They won 100 nil. Yeah, exactly. And this, I think, tells you the difference between the ARL and News Limited because I don't think there's any way if News Limited won the case as convincingly as the ARL did the first time, they would have entertained any compromise talks with the ARL at all. Like the ARL still were kind of like bending over to try to reach an agreement. And News Limited are insisting that the Mariners and Rams be part of the competition. <laughs> but also, you go from 10 teams to 22 overnight. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but of course, all this was to be moot anyway, any compromise talks, because of one Jeffrey Cousins. Our old friend Jeffrey. So this was Cousins' immediate response to an idea of compromise. Why would we wish to make any deal with them, even if it was proper to do so, when they don't have anything to offer? Foxtel is in an incredibly weak position. I mean... He's right that Foxtel are in a weak position. He's right that why would Optus, as the victors, be you know coming to a compromise with their chief competitor just to be good blokes? It was in his trench in Gallipoli saying that the game was had to be run by the people for the people and yeah. it's a people's game. You know, sport's more important than anything. This isn't a, you know, fight about money. This is about the game. And it's like, well, all the game wants to do is get back together. You've got, you know, your mate who's running the game basically coming on his knees to News Limited, even though he had a decisive victory. And yet Jeff Cousins is still, you know, saying, well, no, the law has spoken. We're going ahead. Foxtel can do what they want. But, you know, we're going ahead with the ARL and, you know, we'll see who wins. So you're saying that he was a um, capitalist chief executive and not a um, (laughs) Karl Marx uh, devotee. But, you know, it was just a victory for the little people. You know, Cousins came out and said, we played a game of poker without a pair of twos. Murdoch spent $150 and came away with nothing. You know, Optus, just a a plucky band of upstarts who, you know, (laughs) somehow managed to win against the odds. (laughs) I don't think, like... I made the point strongly enough when we spoke about it last about Cousin's level of villainy because I was swayed by your argument that ultimately his is of a lesser scale than Packer and Murdoch. You know, he was doing the best for Optus. 
But I think where I'm coming from is reading this whole saga play out chronologically, seeing yeah. over the course of a year, you know, every time there's, you know, the vaguest hint of a compromise talk, Jeffrey Cousins pops up and said, no, not happening. We're going to win. And so don't even worry about it. Like, it's just so frustrating. What's just the disingenuousness of, uh, you know, claiming to be for the game when you obviously yeah. got your other interests? <laughs> But so regardless, that was the end of compromise talks at this point. Uh, the two-tier plan for 1996 had been killed off shortly after the judgment and all this uncertainty. And it was from the ARL's point of view to be business as usual with a 20-team comp in 1996. The pay TV landscape was looking you know, very strongly in Optus Vision's favor. And again, Jeff Cousins has said, you know, this decision is first and foremost a win for sport, uh, but said it would also help. Optus Vision, of course, just a little bit, you know, <laughs> win for sport. <laughs> um, this civil war that's decimated two countries <laughs> is a win for democracy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the Optus reps went on to say that, you know, the Errol, it wasn't even that integral to the success of Opt- Optus Vision, but, you know, it's nice to have, so we'll take it. You know, it's a very minor part of our entertainment package. Oh, yeah, I think they had the NSL soccer yeah. <laughs> as their jewel. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, Foxtel went all in on Super 12, talking about how this was a new era for Australian rugby. And, you know, okay, well, at this stage, we don't even need rugby league because the Super 12 competition we've got is really strong. It's worth noting and celebrating the fact that that was a proper competitor to the rugby league in Australia back then and now. I don't want to undersell that in this moment. I think you can listen to our World in Union chapter and see that, like, the Super 12 was a great concept that was for a a number of years a very legitimate rival now but all i'm saying is like celebrate the fact that it's no longer (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) oh no but also i I think it's important to put it in context so david dodds who was a um you know foxtel boss said it's regrettable if that's the way it ends up and we don't have any super league but that's where rugby union super 12 has come very much into the equation we're plugging holes vacated by super league by beefing up our rugby union schedule The response that we had to Super 12, of which we showed two live games last weekend, has been amazing and means we have an ideal substitute. Not really. Um, Which, you know, there's some truth there, but obviously, you know, that's talking tough. They needed rugby league. I love the way Dodds undercut his own argument. There was a criticism that they'd, you know, taken Super 12 off free-to-air. The free-to-air coverage they offered was like a one-hour highlight match per week. And he was accused of hijacking the sport, of taking it off free to wear. But he said, that's not true. He said, several years ago, the ABC used to show club rugby on Saturday afternoons. Through lack of interest, they dropped it. Then Seven had it. Then nobody had it. The interest was reignited when Australia was dominant, but the interest was only at international level. Then suddenly, when someone comes along who's prepared to back the game at a certain level, it's a big drama. One might well ask the question, if it was such a big drama, how come it hasn't been accommodated by the free-to-air networks over the period I nominated? If there was so much (laughs) deprivation about it, how come it hasn't been picked up by another entity? Uh, Very good questions, Mr. Dodds. (laughs) Well, I can answer those questions for you. (laughs) (laughs) It's unwatchable. But at this stage, it was necessary for someone to come in and put this all into context, someone to talk about the value and the glory of sport above all any, you know, silly pay TV enterprises. So um, this is a long quote, but I think it really gets to the heart of the matter. And, And so I want to read it for you, Andrew, and for our listeners in full. So here we go. Some of the older guys in the office tell me it's not that many years ago that a guy wrote a song that was a summary of what Australia was all about. Football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars was one man's anthem for life in Australia. I don't know who that fellow is today, but his song needs a total rewrite. Meat pies hardly exist. They've been swamped by the Big Mac from America and a dozen forms of takeaway from Asia. The Holden car (laughs) might just as well be a rebadged Toyota and the poor old kangaroos being whipped straight off the coat of arms onto the char grill. That leaves football. (laughs) And football in this town means rugby league. I want to point out that this battle is, again, entirely about pay TV. News Limited funded Super League. In an attempt to generate rugby league for Foxtel, Optus Vision put in the majority of the ARL fighting funds to ensure that it kept rugby league on its own cable. Without the pay TV, there would have been no battle. This struggle has given us a sneak preview of how careful we need to be to protect our sports and how keen the pay TV operators are to gain access to those sports. 
I genuinely long for the moment when we can get back to what we want most of all, a time when football is the most important thing happening in rugby league, when we argue only about which teams will win and which players are best. I want that for all obvious reasons, but for one extra special reason. I don't want anything to cloud the one absolute certainty in rugby league. 1996 is the year of the rooster. Yours, James Packer. (laughs) The absolute nerve of this bloke. The absolute nerve of the Sun Herald to run that in good faith. (laughs) My favourite part was the... um the comparison of the meat pie to these uh, upstart Asian takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I left it a bit too late, but I considered reaching out to Matt Nabel to get him to read that soliloquy for us. That would have been beautiful. <laughs> I think you did an admirable Matt Nabel uh, impression there. Actually. <laughs> I hope everyone could see my influences there. I was really trying uh, to give it that Nabel spin, but um, <laughs> I had to read that several times to just get my head around the fact that James Packer had the nerve to write that. Well, it doesn't sound like something he would write, to be honest. But Yeah. <laughs> this is what was being reported. This is what we were seeing is that people were walking away from rugby league. We had reports of merchandise sales being way down to the point that it was even mooted a class action by merchandisers to Sue News Limited for damages uh, to the tune of $50 million. So I think around this time, a lot of rugby league people would have been learning about the word Pyrrhic for the first time, because a lot of reports were referring to the ARL's win as a Pyrrhic victory. The game was in utter shambles. As we'll see, you know, the bitterness was far from over. There's a lot to discuss in our next chapter about how rugby league in Australia was going to proceed. But I just want to finish this chapter with, you know, a really beautiful piece by Ian Heads. I'm going to email it to Ian just to give him a reminder of how good a writer he is. But he wrote this shortly before the Burchett judgment came down. In the shadow of Justice Burchett's monumental decision, the opposing camps could do worse than consider words from distinguished league men of long ago. In 1935, the great league journalist Claude Corbett stood in front of a photo of the game's pioneering officials and later penned the following words. I will leave those pictures on the wall with the hope that they will be preserved for future generations to gaze upon and reflect upon what manner of men they were, who built up from a shaky foundation, an edifice which seems likely to stand for all time as a monument to enterprise and courage. The final words for contemplation, with the liberty taken of a bracketed 1996 edition, belong to J.C. Davis, the cynic, league's foremost chronicler of foundation years, who in 1920 wrote, The game is greater than the players and officials. It must go on in its full bloom and glory, long after each generation, great and small, passes on to the benches. It is those sort of handed down responsibilities outlined all those distant seasons ago that must be shouldered by the men of Phillips Street and of Super League if League is to be born again in 1996. He's a real beautiful uh, wordsmith. Absolutely. But that is where we leave this chapter. So a big victory for the ARL, but a lot of work to be done to unify the game. And we're going to hear all about those efforts in our next chapter. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening once again. Really would love to hear some some legal opinion on what we've discussed over the last two weeks. Uh, Kyle Kutasi, I know, will not need an invitation to let us know what he thinks, but um, would also love any other legal minds to weigh in because um, this was like by far the hardest chapter for me to put together. So many brilliant minds at work. Whatever you want to think of the judgment or the arguments, uh, so much thought and care went into crafting the Super League argument and the ARL counter. It really was a marvel to read through it all. So please send in your thoughts. I actually feel proud of the game to attract this many heavyweight people, you know, yeah. to fight over it. It's, I don't know, it's yeah. something, there's a perverse pride in that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so on that note, we'll finish up. So uh, yeah, send us your thoughts, the rugby league digest at gmail.com. Hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Please uh, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Five stars and a nice comment will be lovely. And with that, we will speak to you next week. That's duress asking for that like that. (laughs) If you want to leave a comment, do so. Don't be forced into it. (laughs) All right. We'll speak to you later. Bye-bye.